Amen. Amen. Brother Terry Miller, could you bring me a cup of water? My preaching tends to get a bit dry. And I'm trying to prevent that, a little preemptive strike on the dryness of the preaching. No, we're going to begin in John chapter 1 today, so if you want to pull out your Bibles and uh, find your way to John chapter 1. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, if you need a Bible, we have a stack of them in the back. They're available to you. Uh, if, you if you need a Bible, you can raise your hand, Brother Theron, and be happy to bring you one. Uh, but uh, we're going to be in John chapter 1. I don't usually title my messages. I don't usually outline my, my preaching. Um, I, I find it, it constricts the Spirit of God, and I can't move as well. And so uh, I don't normally do that, but today I've entitled this, Who is this man? Who is this man? We are going to be examining the man, Jesus Christ, today through seven witnesses. There is, a, there is a theme throughout the New Testament that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There is a theme throughout the Old Testament that the Holy One of Israel, Jesus Christ, is the Son of God. And my prayer and my aim today is to have Him manifested to us today. John chapter 1, we see a man by the name of Nathaniel. Last, last week we, well it wasn't last week, it was actually at the beginning of June, uh, I think it was June 5th actually, that I preached on seeking Jesus. Uh, there were these who, uh, John 6, 24 says, When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. These people had just been fed. They were of the 5,000 that had been fed on that mountainside. And they came seeking for Jesus and Jesus calls them out. And he says, you didn't come because of the miracles. You came because you were able to eat bread and you were filled. And I pointed out the fact that many times we come to God with a need. And it is a serious, earnest need. It is something that our lives need desperately. But we come looking for the wrong thing. We receive not because we ask amiss. When we are looking for healing, when we are looking for comfort, when we are looking for salvation, when we are looking for life everlasting, we ought to be just simply seeking Jesus. Because when you find the person of Jesus Christ, you will find salvation. When you find the person of Jesus Christ, you will find everlasting life. You will find healing. You will find comfort. You will find restoration. Seek Jesus primarily. Now the Lord has led me through to this point here where we will be seeing who is this man. What does the Bible witness to this man? Thank you, brother. John chapter 1, we're going to start right here in verse 43. John chapter 1 verse 43 says this, The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. And Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. I want you to note that Philip calls Jesus the son of Joseph. Okay, this is going to be very important for what I'm going to tell us next. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Who is this man that you're speaking of? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? All right, where I grew up, Knoxville was the town that we would have said that about. Can anything good come out of Knoxville? Okay. You may have a town in mind, please don't mention it, because you may be mentioning somebody's hometown that they're very happy with, okay? Um, but that was, that was just what came to mind with me. And so you get this, this mindset of what Nathaniel's going through. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, come and see. That, oh, that phrase, that's good. Um, there, there needs to be a book written on that phrase, come and see. And I know the person that's going to do it, and the Lord is going to bless it. Uh, but just uh, consider that phrase today. Maybe that's the only thing you need to get out of today. Maybe we could close in prayer right now. Philip, 
came to Nathanael, said, we found the one. We found that holy one of Israel. He's from Nazareth. Nathanael says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And he says, come and see. You cannot come on the testimony of your parents. You cannot come on the testimony of your husband or your wife. You yourself have to come into the very presence of Almighty God and see. Verse 47 says this, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, of whom is no guile. Now, I want to pull some doctrine out of that just briefly, and I'm not going to take a lot of time on this. There's two phrases in there that are very important. I believe Nathanael was saved. I believe Philip was still lost at this point. The reason I believe Philip was still lost is because when he claimed that Jesus was the son of Joseph, he didn't understand truly who this man was. He saw the prophet, he saw the Messiah, he saw this one who is fulfilling these things, this is the man. But he had no idea that he was the son of God. Okay. Nathaniel, however, Jesus says this about him, an Israelite indeed. That statement right there shows that he is of the chosen of Israel. Okay. Now what do I mean by that? Well, in Romans 9, 6, the last part of that verse says, For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. There were some in Israel that were not looking for the Messiah. There were some in the nation of Israel, flesh and blood Israel, who were not looking to Jesus Christ, looking to that cross, looking to that future atonement, okay? I believe Nathaniel was one of those ones that was, because he was an Israelite indeed. Jesus gives him that title because it says, Jesus saith of him, not to him, of him. He's claiming this on Nathaniel's life, okay? Second thing is, an Israelite in whom is no guile. Psalm 32, 2 says, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Jesus Christ is looking at this man, Nathaniel, knowing fully Nathaniel's heart, knowing fully that he is looking for the Messiah. He is looking in, by faith toward that coming sacrifice. And he sees that he is believing that sacrifice fully. And what Nathaniel needed to see was, as it's been said, that ruddy Jew walking up to him was his God. That's what he needed to see. He knew the Messiah was coming. He was believing on that coming sacrifice. But what he needed to see was that Jew walking up to him is God. But blessed is a man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, in whose spirit there is no guile. This is speaking of a saved man. Iniquity is lawlessness in your heart. And when lawlessness is not imputed to you, an imputation, that is, that is placing on your account, okay? That means the iniquities are no more. What did God say? Your iniquities will I remember no more, okay? Nathaniel was saved. All right? But he just needed to see that this Jew walking up to him is his God. Let's continue reading here. Verse 48. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. That's the only thing that Nathanael needed. He didn't need to hear John 3, 16. He didn't need to hear Peter's sermon where 3,000 got saved. He didn't need to hear Paul preaching. All he needed to hear was that this man saw him sitting alone under a fig tree, alone with his thoughts. And look what he proclaims. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel born again. Nobody can call Jesus Christ the Son of God but by the Holy Ghost. Paul tells us that. At this point, the Holy Ghost, I believe, had full control of Nathanael, and he was able to proclaim, Thou art the Son of God. This is the witness of Nathanael, of who 
this man, Jesus, is. Now, we could dig real deep into the Son of God, that wording there, and the King of Israel, and we can go back through the Old Testament, and we can see everywhere that word King of Israel is referring to the coming Messiah, and boy, I'm telling you what, that would be an amazing study. If you really want to know who Jesus is, you need to see the Son of God in the Old Testament, because if you don't, you, you only have part of the picture. You only have the man that walked the earth and healed and, and forgave people. You don't see the Holy One of Israel with righteous indignation and wrath against sin. You don't see the creator of the universe. You don't see the king of Israel. You don't see the coming king of the universe. That's why you've got to take the entire book. You've got to take the whole thing in order to know who this man is. The next witness that we're going to see is in Luke chapter 5. And I want to turn there. Luke chapter 5. Starting at verse 18. <clears throat> and behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy. This is verse 18. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went up upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his, with his couch into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven. That really tripped some people off right there. The scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Who is this man? Who is this man that thinks he can forgive sins? God alone can forgive sins. They're right on that. Verse 22, but when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, he answered their thoughts. How do you like that? What reason ye in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee or to say rise up and walk? Which is easier? For me to say your sins are forgiven you or for, you, for me to say you rise up and walk who hasn't been able to walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. He saith unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And immediately he arose before them, and took up that whereon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Who is this man? He just proved that he has power on earth to forgive sins because he said to the man that was sick of the palsy, rise up and walk, and he did. Who is this man? Who is this man, Jesus? Who is this ruddy Jew that walked the Jewish countryside, the, walked through Jerusalem, walked on the Sea of Galilee, walked beside, walked upon the hills, walked in the desert, walked alone? walked together with his disciples, walked with God. Who is this man? Luke chapter 7. That was the, the witness of the healed. Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 36, we get the witness of the forgiven. Luke seven thirty six says this, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner. And if you do some deep studying, you'll find out that this is Mary, the brother of Lazarus, the sister of Martha. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself. Again, within himself. These thoughts that you speak within yourself, God hears. God sees. God knows. And one day, the secret thoughts and intents of your heart will be broadcast across all of creation, because it says they will be manifested. Every single thought, the idle thoughts, will be brought to judgment. 
every idle word will be brought to judgment. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Sorry, verse 39, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him. You see that? What manner? He was looking on the outward what, what the fruit of her sin nature had wrought in her life. Does God look at who you are? Yes, he does. Does he look at what manner of person you are? Yes, he does. The problem is when we come to God and we come to him for forgiveness and we come to him for, for salvation, we come to him with what manner of people we are. We bring him the fruit of our sin nature when he is looking at the root of it. You may come to him and say, God, I've been a liar. God, I've been an adulteress. God, I've been an adulterer. God, I've been a fornicator. God, I've been a, a murderer. God, I've been hatred. Yeah, you have been, but there's a root behind it. That's you, that is who you are, is sin. And until you come to Jesus Christ with not what you've done, but who you are in his sight, you will never find salvation. You can confess, you can lay your sins at his feet, but until you lay that sin nature at his feet, he cannot make you a new creature. That is our responsibility, to come to him and fall on his mercy. But coming back here, we see what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Verse 40 says, Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have something somewhat to say unto thee. He saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose he that to whom he forgave most. And he said, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon. I love that. I have that underlined. He turned to the woman and said unto Simon. Seest thou this woman? They're, they're, they've locked eyes at this point, I believe. I don't know. Maybe, maybe she still couldn't see because of the tears that were flowing from her eyes. But Jesus was looking upon this woman who was known as a sinner. See thou, seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath wiped my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore, I say unto thee, her sins, the fruit of her sin nature, those things with what manner of woman she was, there, wherefore, I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loveth much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Did we not read that in our verses in 1 John today? That is not a coincidence. I did not plan that. Who in here hates your brother? Who in here hates your neighbor, hates your husband, hates your wife, hates your children? God is making manifest to you that you are still a child of Satan. Fear and tremble and fall on God's mercy. Her sins which are many are forgiven her, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, and here it is again, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? Who is this man? Who is this man that, that claims to be God? Who is this man that heals? Who is this man that saw me sitting alone under a tree that knew the thoughts of my heart? Who is this man? Luke chapter 8, just the next page over, verse 22, we get the witness of the wind and the waves. 
Now it came to pass on a certain day that he, which went into a, that he went into a ship with his disciples. This is Luke 8, 22. And he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep, and there came down a storm of wind upon the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said unto them, Where is your faith? They began wondering. Then they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and the water that they obey him. Do you see the picture of Jesus Christ that your Bible is giving you? Do you see a man who can command the elements? Who can cause the wind and cause it to cease? Who can create the waves and cause them to still? Who can forgive sins? who can cause restoration, who can give strength to feeble legs. This is the man Jesus, the Son of God, the Holy One of Israel, the King of Israel, the God of Jacob, the God of Isaac, the God of Abraham, the God of Noah, the God of Moses, the God of the Bible, Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 16. Look at verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto him this question that every single person alive will have to answer one day. But whom say ye that I am? Whom say ye that I am? Whom say ye that I am? Am I the son of a carpenter? Am I a prophet? Am I a teacher? Or am I the son of God? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and saith unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. This is something that only God the Father can reveal unto you. No words of mine, no words of any preacher, any evangelist, any mother, any father, any grandmother, nobody, none of that can reveal to you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You may hear it, You may think you know it, you may think you understand it, but until it grabs hold of your heart and you are broken before Almighty God and you say, Oh my God, help me! You will never see that He is the Son of God. That He has the power on earth to forgive your sins, to cleanse your life of your wretchedness, to cleanse your life of the, the sin of the past, of the wickedness of your life, to give you new life in Christ, to make you a new creature to set you free, to make you free from the law of sin and death. Only God the Father can reveal that through to you. But we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. God was pleased through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That's why we preach it. That's why this book will always be the cornerstone of this church. Because without it, this is a show. And it is a shame and it's grievous to the heart of God. If we did nothing else but sit in here and have three hours of preaching, God would be pleased. Do you understand that? The church, God said, is the pillar and the ground of the truth. We don't gather to worship. 
though we can worship corporately and it's a blessing. We do not gather to pray, though we pray together as a church family, and it is a blessing. We gather to sit under the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God because this book is the only thing that will change your family, that will transform your life, that will give you everlasting life. This book is it. This book needs to be the cornerstone of your home. It needs to be the cornerstone of your life, of your very being. You need to desire this book more than your necessary food. It would probably do some of us well to fast for a few days and pray and get into this book. That may be what God is waiting for. Jesus said, this kind cometh not but by fasting and by prayer. What is wreaking havoc in your home? What is tearing your home apart? You won't get rid of it until you fast and pray and get in this book period. It will destroy you. It will destroy your home. It'll destroy your family for generations, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the third and fourth generation. That's still in the book. Fathers, that weight is on you. Don't make your wife do it. But God the Father is the only one that can reveal this to you. I can't. I can get up here, I can jump and scream and sweat and turn red and, and holler and throw stuff and spit and jump up on the pews and kick the pulpit over. I can do all of that. But until God the Father reveals it unto you, it'll have none effect in your life. Mark chapter 15. Starting at verse 33. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come and to take him down. Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. When the centurion which stood over against him saw that, he so cried out, and gave, and gave up the ghost, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. This is the witness of 1 John chapter 5. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. As you're turning there, Luke 23, 46 says, when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. John 19, 32 through 37 says, Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith there came out blood and water. And he saw it and bare record. And his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith is true, that ye might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him should not be broken. And another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. First John chapter 5, starting in verse 6, says this. This is he that came by water and blood even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 14 of John chapter 1 says this, And the word was manifested, and he walked among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That word is the Lord Jesus Christ. The man, Jesus Christ. And there are three that bear record in heaven. God the Father, God the Word, and God the Holy Ghost. And your Bible says these three are one. Not became one. Not will someday be one. Not are almost one. But they are one. But then we have the witness of the cross. It says, and there are three that bear witness in earth. You notice that doesn't say on earth. That says in earth. This is speaking of the earthen vessel of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ hanging on that cross. There are three that bear witness in earth. The spirit, that is the personal spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. The water and the blood. And as we just read, all three of those departed the body of the Lord Jesus Christ as he hung there. And that centurion proclaimed, truly this man is the Son of God. This is the record that we have. This is the proof that we have of who this man is. The Son of God. The Holy One of Israel. The Savior. The Mighty One. The Prince of Peace. The King. And my friend. There are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. When you agree with something, it is of like manner and like purpose and like object. And all three of those things that came out of the body of Jesus Christ at that very moment spoke to the very fact that he is the Son of God. Because that is what caused that centurion to proclaim that very thing. Verse 9 says this, If we receive the witness of men, verse 8, the witness of God is greater, verse 7. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath this witness in himself. The Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. That very spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, bearing witness with your spirit that you are his child. That is the proof of salvation. That is how you know you are born again. And when the spirit of Jesus Christ bears witness with your spirit, there is not a preacher alive that can convince you that you are lost. But if the word of God is being preached, and the Bible is going forth, and the Holy Ghost is moving, and God has a protection around the property. And you cannot claim that spirit bearing witness with your spirit. You better run to the cross of Calvary. Because you're lost and you're dead in your trespasses and sins. Twice dead, plucked up by the roots. And whatever it is you're holding to has made you sevenfold a child of hell. Run to the cross. Seek his mercy. If any man come to Christ, he must first believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If any man come to God, he that believeth on the Son of God hath this witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not on the record that God gave of his Son. One day you will stand before God Almighty. You will give an account. You will be judged out of this book. The words that were spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be judged by. You will be judged by this verse right here. He that believeth not God hath made him, God, a liar. Because you believed not the record that God gave of you. That Jesus Christ, that man which is born in Bethlehem, 2,000 years ago, and came out of Nazareth, and went through Galilee, and walked those dusty streets, and touched and healed the leopards and lepers, and rose the dead, and gave life to those, gave sight to the blind, and gave 
forgiveness of sins. You did not believe God the Father's record that he is speaking to your heart right at this moment, that he is the Son of God, and salvation is only in him. And when you find him, you find eternal life, period. But until you find the Jesus Christ of this Bible, you will not find salvation. And you are still lost and dead in your trespasses and sins. And this is the record that God hath given us to us eternal life. And this life is where? In his son. It's in his son. It's in Jesus. It's not in a prayer. It's not in a program. It's not in a church. It's not in anything but in Jesus Christ himself. So why on earth would you run to anything but Jesus? Find him. Find Jesus of the Bible. Run to him. Cling to him. Beg him for his mercy. But he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not 